Good morning. So today, uh, what are we talking about? Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Sassy here. Is anyone there? Hi, my name is Sassy. I'm based in Berlin and I want to welcome you to Sisi, the podcast where you see what others see. In this, our first season, we're talking about colors. Petra, how are you? Hello, Sessi. Very excited to get started with our interview today. Our guest is Rafael Lozano Hemmer, a Mexican-Canadian artist known for his incredible large-scale interactive installations where public participation is essential. His installations are a meeting point for architecture and performing art, as well as for artistic expression and technology. He studied and graduated from both University of Victoria in British Columbia and Concordia University in Montreal, where he studied different fields, physics, art history, and earned a chemistry degree. Though he did not pursue a career as a scientist, his interest in chemistry and technology has influenced his work in many ways. Raphael's large-scale interactive installations have been featured at the Millennium Celebrations in Mexico City, the cultural capital of Europe in Rotterdam, the UN World Summit of Cities in Lyon, the opening of the Yamaguchi Center of Arts and Media in Japan, the 50th anniversary of the Guggenheim Museum in New York, and the Winter Olympics in Vancouver. He has been subject of solo exhibitions in museums like the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney, the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, D.C., and the Amor Pacific Museum of Art in Seoul, among many others. His work is included in numerous collections around the world, including the MoMA in New York, the Tate Gallery in London, AGO in Toronto, Humex and Muak in Me Mexico City, Berusan Contemporary in Istanbul, among many, many others. He was the first artist to represent Mexico at the Venice Biennale, a recipient of a long list of prizes, such as two BAFTA awards for interactive art in London, a golden Nika at the Prix Art Electronica in Austria, Artist of the Year Rave Award from Wired Magazine, a Rockefeller Fellowship, the Trophée des Lumières in Lyon, and an International Bauhaus Award in Dessau. Son of nightclub owners, he is also a DJ, although when he plays, it's under a different name. Welcome, Rafael. Good morning in Canada. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Very excited to be here. Uh, Rafael, you are a very talented and creative artist, but also a very diligent one. Just in these last months, you presented a tremendous installation at Art Basel, and last week you inaugurated the solo exhibit Common Measures at Pace Gallery in New York City. Just days before, after having opened a breathtaking outdoor exhibition called Listening Forest at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Arkansas. This exhibit is composed by different immersed installations that go from a body and environmental heat detector that translates this heat into an explosion of colors to giant stick figure puppets and a river of fluid letters. All of this accompanied by light, music, and projection features. What was your vision when putting together Listening Forest? What can visitors of this Pace Age Open Air Ensemble anticipate from this exhibit? So um, the exhibition Listening Forest is basically a mid-career retrospective of outdoor works. So I've been working in outdoor public art for a really long time, but usually I get to do one experience here. I was offered by Crystal Bridges the possibility to have an ensemble, like an exhibition made out of eight different artworks, which kind of wove um, a, a thematic of interconnection, uh, relationship to nature, and also relationship to echoes or memories. Um, as part of this project, I um, met a lot of historians, stakeholders, indigenous elders, community leaders. Um, I had never been to Arkansas in the past. And I learned a lot about their history, about the 
you know, diverse um, groups of people that live in the area. And I wanted Listening Forest to kind of be like a mirror or like an echo. Um, think of the forest as something that has sentience, that can hear you, can see you, can sense you and feel you. And then the forest is reacting to your very presence. There was a, a, an anecdote, a, a historical anecdote written in 1837 by a guy called Charles Babbage. Babbage said in 1837, he's, he's the guy who originally invented the computer, that when we speak into the air, we make the molecules vibrate. And he said, one day we will have a computer that is so sophisticated that the vibrations of the atmospheric molecules will be rewound and we'll be able to hear the voices of everybody who's spoken in the past. So to Babbage, the atmosphere was a vast library that contained everything that everybody had ever said. And if we think about a forest and, you know, the rings of the trees or the way in which the escarpment or the ravine gets geologically um, produced, um, it has a memory. And the question is, in this project, we're trying to, to create a, a social memory, a kind of historical memory, and, of course, the creation of new uh, relationships that come as visitors come through. So, yeah, the project is is uh, eight different approaches for remembering. Fascinating. So looking at your work and what you're saying, um, besides being spectacular, because it is, one could identify some common aspects. Um, it is democratic and playful, I would say. Democratic because it brings art closer to the audience by either placing it out in the open or by conceptually turning galleries exclusive white box Uh, accessible uh, through interaction. And it also gives the public the power to decide the outcome of the project. It is playful because besides inviting the public to interact within the artwork, it messes up with scales. And I also think that your work is an instrument of resistance against anonymity. People use your installations to say, here I am, And this is the recording of my voice or my heartbeat. It's a kind of a proof of existence, I would say. And finally, I would also say that it has a David versus Goliath character to it because it allows to somehow fight big cities' homogeneity by using something like a surveillance camera to produce a touching image or a fun display of lights and colors. Was This your intention from the beginning, or was it more an experimental process uh, that developed through time? And what I really want to ask you is, what did it take personally for you to become the artist that you are today? So those are many questions, and it will take me a long time to answer in detail. But um, basically, I always depart from the conviction that art, uh, my art, is incomplete and out of control. So as a fundamental design decision, I want to make sure that there are loose ends, that the artwork is not a monologue, but rather that it's a platform for people to self-represent. So indeed, most of my works uh, listen to the public, track the public, and react to their presence or to their content. There's an awful word uh, from the marketing world called crowdsourcing, but that is in fact what I do. So to give you an example, uh, one of the projects in, in Arkansas is basically a field of 3,000 light bulbs, which are glimmering to the heartbeat of different people. If no one were to participate, those light bulbs would be off. And it is a humbling kind of uh, affair to depend on participation for the artwork to exist. So ultimately, The pieces are affordances. They're moments uh, for people to gain a certain degree of agency. Having said that, it's true that I am also careful with the playfulness and with the connectivity and the relationships that can be emerged, that we take a critical approach to technology. So very often technology is used as a special effect that has in itself, its objective is, you know, just this capability to wow people, you know, to create a certain kind of hype. Um, and I'm very far away from that. Um, I'm not so much interested in the originality or novelty of technology, but rather on its inevitability. 
In other words, I work with technology not because it's something new, but because it's something that is basically inevitable in our daily life. In Germany, where you live, I think that the average is uh, people spend six hours a day connected to a screen, be it the phone, internet, or TV. And so it's very impossible for us to imagine what we would be like without technology, without taking into consideration that our public is, in fact, already mediated. Our economy, our war, our relationships are all taking place alongside these global networks of connectivity. And so I'm not moralizing that technology is good or bad, uh, but I am saying that we must keep a, a critical approach to, to, to using these technologies because I don't want to be uh, seen as someone who is just sort of justifying techno-optimism. I think that we're living in extremely dark times. I think that um, technological and other manipulation is that. Is, is is happening worldwide. And I think that it is just honest to try and work with technology to provide either alternatives or Brechtian kind of critical views of how this technology operates to create a sense of, um, of literacy, you know, about how this technology operates. Um, so that's, that's kind of like a larger uh, context, right? It's basically uh, the desire for an artwork to create a sense of personalization, of augmentation. I like that you said that there is a play of scales. Um, on the subject of anonymity, uh, we also must be careful because the very technologies that I use for people to participate are routinely used by military, corporate, and police um, systems to oppress people, right? And so I'm very aware as I work with these technologies that they're not neutral, that they come with a history of prejudice and adversarial and, uh, you know, almost, uh, uh, what's the word in English? One second word in English is coming predatorial, uh, almost predatorial um, genesis. And so I, I, I'm always in the boundary between the seduction of participation and the violence of Orwellian tracking. Raphael, the, these technologies you're mentioning, these surveillance technologies, um, in your artwork and installation, you turn them from something menacing into something positive that helps people relate and making humans' intrinsic need um, to socialize visible. It makes very clear that through interpersonal connections, people feel alive. And I believe your art has touched many souls. And at the same time, it also portrays ongoing social and political issues and problems. And do you consider yourself as an activist who, whose artwork provides people's means to express? And if so, what message would you wish visitors and participants to take home and to spread maybe um it's 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 hard to generalize my practice over the past 30 years has been quite diverse sometimes the pieces are very you know hammer in the head kind of uh, straightforward uh uh you know activism and other times they're more subtle and they're more retreats or uh alternatives or interruptions to the normal narratives that we have in society um it, it depends on the project most of the times i consider myself um and an artist that is curious about the world we live in. As an activist, however, I think I act more as a citizen than as an artist. I think that the artist is a citizen. So, for example, I stay away from artwork that is very um, moralistic or pedagogic or didactic or artwork that has an agenda uh, that is teleological, that is manipulating propaganda, all these things I, I, I am against. Uh, well, not that I'm against, I just don't do that because I, I think that that comes in too on the nose is the expression in English. It's too too evident and too simplistic. Um, I like to, to create more pieces about tiny relationships, uh, relationships between people meeting each other in a public space, for example, to disparate realities that come together. And I find it hopeful that, you know, Art is an opportunity for people to share an experience. I find that, you know, when I'm optimistic, which is not very often, I think that art has a role to play in repairing some of the, you know, uh, wrongdoing, uh, mostly by, you know, corporate and uh, 
and uh, nationalistic agents. But I think that um, that it's yeah, it's hard to it's hard to generalize. Some some pieces uh, that are more political, they're not political because of the piece, but because of the site or the context. So, for example, I made a project across the U.S.-Mexico border where people could speak to each other through these massive bridges of light between El Paso, Texas, and Juarez, Chihuahua. And it's possibly the best project I've ever done, not because of what I did, but because of the tens of thousands of people on both sides of the border that would gather around the wall that is supposed to divide them and speak to each other with dignity, with poetry, with warmth, with politics, with, uh, with everything from declarations of love and serenades to uh, flirting and then also families who were separated. Um, and and that's what I like. I think I think a lot about art as being a radio station, right? Um, I create something, but then the programming is made by the public as they express themselves. And of course, that turns out to be political, and that turns out to also be democratic in the sense that we try and create a platform that gives people a voice and amplifies this voice. And in this case, in the case of the U.S.-Mexico border tuner project, it um, connects the two sides of an otherwise completely unfair, racist, and problematic division uh, uh, that, that should not be there. Rafa, levels of nothingness. Uh, this is an interactive performance installation of yours inspired by Kandinsky's experimental performance, The Gelbe Klang, or The Yellow Sound which he composed presumably because of a rare neurological condition called synesthesia. In people with synesthesia, one sense is triggered as a result of experiencing another one. So when Vasily Kandinsky heard sounds, he saw colors. And when he saw colors, he heard music. In Levels of Nothingness, a computerized microphone analyzes a live human voice and controls a full rig of robotic lights producing a color show. You depicted synesthesia by turning language into a concert of color lights. Besides Kandinsky's synesthesia, was there anything else, perhaps a personal experience that inspired you to produce this installation? Yeah, I mean, that was a commission. The Guggenheim approached me to try and take a stab at the, um, the yellow sound. And, um, if, if you study the performances of the yellow sound in history, they, they, they're all very, um, let's call them unfortunate. Um, people have tried, uh, to take, make an opera about the color yellow being the protagonist. And, and, you know, people have, uh, to an extent, attempted this. And I attempted it, but from a different perspective. I attempted it from the perspective of critical theory. I worked with philosopher Brian Masumi, who is uh, an expert in perception. And um, we worked through the philosophy of color. How is color um, interpreted? How is it um, prepared? How does it uh, subterfuge? And then we created, a, or he created, a libretto of all of these uh, texts by uh, philosophers like William James and, and Deleuze and so on. And these texts were presented um, as a as a score, if you will, that an actress, uh, Isabella Rossellini, read out loud. And then my, my experiment was what would happen if we take the philosophy of color and we hook it up to the existing um, archetypes of rock and roll uh, robot lighting? how all of the uh, uh, sort of canned effects of color washes and so on, which I often criticize, were connected to what she said and how she said it. And um, I, I like to call that project experimental because the truth is we don't, We didn't really know what it would look like at the very until the very end. And that's one reason to do things is when you don't know what's going to happen. Um, the project in the end was uh, I, 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 effective to an extent. It was nerdy, but um, but it was missing. It was missing something. It was missing a, a certain soul. I have long studied people like Joseph Albers or people who are the real Uh, masters of color. And I have enormous respect and admiration for the use of color um, in art. I also have a very long-standing beef 
against what people call architainment, which is this idea that color changing lights are used for any building, which is now magenta, now CN, now it's Congo blue. And it drives me crazy. I mean, I think all lighting designers need to study Joseph Albers to show some restraint. Um, I was recently in Istanbul where one of the beautiful Bosphorus um, bridges got illuminated by a Dutch company with $40 million worth of lighting. And what happened is that Istanbul has always been a beautifully illuminated city with like very strict color um, temperatures. And it's always golden and gorgeous. And then this company came and destroyed this, this, this massive, beautiful bridge. And now it looks like Reno, Nevada. And there's a problem with that because these lights are homogenizing all of the different kinds of um, architectures that we live with. And there's nothing wrong with Reno, Nevada in Reno, Nevada. What's wrong and what I'm frustrated about is that, of course, 90 percent of people in Istanbul love the color changing lights. So I, I have this I have this feeling, you know, that I'm fighting I'm fighting a fight that is already lost, but it's a it's a fight of restraint. It's a, it's a fight of saying, not because we can have so many colors, do, does it mean we need to use them? We need to use color very, very surgically and for a good reason. And further, it should be left to the experts. And I, by no means, I'm one of them. Um, so in regards of its name, if um, nothingness would rather be associated with black, why then choose this name for such a colorful installation? Well, because nothingness is never black, right? Nothingness is a concept in in physics. Nothingness is a concept that has an enormous quantum mechanical activity, right? There is no such thing as nothingness. And it's really fascinating to explore the different levels of nothingness. Uh, this is the title that Brian Masumi um, himself gave to the project. Um, it's not unlike, uh, for example, sound. I've been studying a lot um, the work of Armour Schaefer, Pauline Oliveros, people who basically talked about soundscape and talked about the fact that there is no such thing as silence, right? That if you stop for a second, you will hear your own heartbeat. You will hear the sound of the environment. And this, this incapability to imagine what life in a vacuum is, is a phenomenological problem that, you know, Husserl already spoke about. Is this idea that Think of it. Think of of being without sound, for example, or think of it without being without language. Right? What what would it be like to think without language? Well, for decades, the phenomenologists tried that, and it didn't work out. We don't. We can't imagine what thinking would be like before language, because we use language to control to to you know sort of organize our our, our brain. Um, likewise with silence. Likewise with darkness. Um, these, these things are nothing and everything. So one last reference. I was fascinated to learn that when the number zero was invented in India, it, uh, it meant nothing, right? This is the number zero represented. There is nothing there. When the Mayans, um, separately came up with the invention of the number zero, For the Mayans, the number zero is everything. And I love that two, you know, incredible cultures came up with the same solution, but one called it nothing and one called it everything. I think that this is really um, suggestive of this idea of nothingness not existing. So interesting, yeah. Hey, Rafael, there is no color without light. And it seems like um, colors have a life of their own. So... The question is, do different colors of light have different densities and or um, frequencies? And if yes, do you consciously choose a certain color or colors when planning your installations? Absolutely, yeah. So I'm interested in light as an electromagnetic phenomena. Um, I'm interested in light as a phenomenon that is schizoid. In other words, it doesn't know if it's a particle or a wave. It depends how you're looking at it. I'm interested in light being basically created through things like explosions. Um, many times, artists of light that we admire, people like, if I tell you who are the artists of light, well, you will tell me, well, James Turrell or, 
or Irwin or Flavin or so on. Um, in most of these cases, the light is a light that's almost spiritual. It's like an interior light, like Terrell himself is a Quaker. And I admire that very much. There's a certain clarity and a certain beauty in this idea of concept of light. But I come from a different kind of light. I come from the light on the one hand of the discotheque. My parents, as Ceci knows, were nightclub owners in Mexico City, and I grew up with uh, strobing lights, color-changing lights, disco balls, and so on. For me, the light of the club is the light to hide. It's not a light to, sh to, to be revealed, but it's a light where you can be somebody other than yourself. When you, for, for a little bit of time, you can hide in this changing light so that you can pretend to be someone other and to an extent experience some kind of catharsis or freedom. Um, so I like that kind of light, the light that confuses, the light that, that uh, lets you hide. And the other kind of light that I'm interested in is the light of the police station, the light of interrogation. The light of the choppers, the helicopters in the U.S.-Mexico border looking for Mexican uh, migrants. Um, the light that is violent, the light of the explosions of the sun. Um, Goethe said that the brighter the light, the darker the shadows. That's that's the kind of light that I'm interested in, a violent light. So I, I work between those two, the violent light and the playful light, the light to hide. And my work is somewhere in between. Now... Phenomenologically, when I look at the actual light that I work with, it's oftentimes thinking of it as a continued spectrum. So I'll give you an example. At the Crystal Bridges show now in Arkansas, we have these lights, which are powerful searchlights. And these searchlights go up into the sky. And of course, there's a lot of problems with that. You in Germany had Albert Speer and you have all these different kinds of ways in which this light was a light of intimidation. Um, today, those lights are a massive problem for birds. Um, birds um, see these lights and they get stuck in their migratory patterns and they actually die because they can't find their way back into, into, into the world. So... We worked with uh, ornithologist uh, Dr. Bird, believe it or not, his name is Dr. Bird, and uh, Dr. Alan Clark. And what we noted is that um, birds actually, their view is really good on the ultraviolet uh, part of the spectrum. And this was a really fascinating finding because by placing an ultraviolet cut filter in all of our searchlights, we managed for the lights to be almost invisible to the migrating birds. And this is this is really great. The idea that a different species sees a different range of the electromagnetic spectrum invites us to imagine that also to be the case for humans. In my studio, I have two colorblind engineers, and I usually I usually use them as an excuse to um, to not use color too much. Um, the truth is that I am insecure about my choices of color. And I think that anybody who pretends to have uh, to dominate the the world of color is something that does not understand that the perception of color is individualized and that what you're seeing is different than what I am seeing. So there is no such thing as a complete totalizing approach to color that commands it. With color, we must be humble. Absolutely. So your blue is not the same blue as mine, I guess. Right? Exactly. <laughs> so, um, talking about heartbeats, you were talking about one of the installations part of the Arkansas exhibit, which was also part of the set of installations that you called Pulse Tang, Pulse Spiral, and the one that you just presented in Art Basel, Pulse of Typology, where heartbeats are central, as you said. And um, these installations so that the audience... Um, can picture them, are formed with thousands of glimmering light bulbs suspended at different heights, and they create a sort of dreamlike landscape which visitors are invited to walk through. And each light bulb represents the heartbeat of a traversing visitor until a newer visitor heartbeat recording replaces the later. So... Um, I want to ask you, could you tell us a bit more about what moves you to work with heartbeats? And also, and we're very interested in uh, knowing um, how, technically speaking, is the connection between a visitor's heartbeat and a light bulb made possible? 
Thank you. Um, there are so many stories to tell. Um, first of all, I'll mention that there is a long tradition of over like six decades of artists working with heartbeats as a, you know, color as a as a device inside of their installations. So people like Jean Dupuy, Jack Goldstein, Diana Dominguez, uh, Burga. I mean, there are there's a lot of artists who have been working with heartbeats, of course, before me. Uh, for me, the 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 start was uh, an anecdote. My ex-wife was pregnant with my twins, and uh, I learned that the ultrasound machine can let you hear the heartbeat of the baby. And being a nerd, I asked for two ultrasound machines so that I could listen simultaneously to the heartbeat of the boy and the heartbeat of the girl. And they were completely different. And they were creating this kind of repetitive pattern. Sometimes they would be in sync and sometimes they would go out of sync. Kind of like the music of Steve Reich or Glenn Branca, Conlon Ankar or Philip Glass. This kind of minimalist coming in and out. And I thought that is beautiful. We could create a concert. Uh, not uh, just of two heartbeats, but of hundreds or thousands of heartbeats simultaneously to create these patterns. So that was the original idea behind the project Pulse Room, which was shown first in 2006 in Puebla, and then in 2007 was the main installation at the Mexican Pavilion in Venice. That project now has kind of snowballed. The latest iteration of the series is called Pulse Topology. And it has, in Basel, we had 6,000 heartbeats uh, simultaneously. And uh, it creates um, valleys and uh, mountains that are upside down that you traverse through. You're surrounded by the heartbeats of the most recent participants. And as you said, when you participate yourself, your own heartbeat displaces the oldest. So the project functions as a memento mori. It reminds us that we're here only for a little time. And, um, you know, as your heartbeat disappears, you know, it's kind of a, a, a nice metaphor for your time um, in, on Earth. Um, the heartbeat, the, the latest versions of this artwork work with a technology called photoplethysmography. And it, it is actually, I think, poetic justice that to detect the heartbeat, we actually use light. How it works is you put your hand underneath a little camera and a little light, and then the light, the camera, detects tiny variations in the coloration of your skin. Because when you have um, the heartbeat, the blood flows, and there's actually more opacity in your skin, um, showing the, 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 art, the artwork can create an electrocardiogram from these tiny variations. And by the way, it works with all uh, skin colors. And um, and then we convert these variations in coloration of your skin to actual electrocardiograms, which we then use to digitally um, dim each light bulb to the heart rate of the different people. So it's kind of a strange variation between light capturing your heartbeat and then light uh, expressing it into the world. There's one last thing that I want to mention about this project. Pulse Topology is, in fact, very much influenced by a Mexican movie called Macario. Macario is a movie by Gabaldon that shows uh, basically a hunger-induced uh, hallucination in the protagonist who walks into the Grutas de Cacahuamilpa, which is this beautiful cave system that we have in Mexico, and where he sees every person in the planet represented by a tiny little flickering candle. So, you know, and the fragility of life is there in this tiny little candles. And for me, Pulse Topology, Pulse Room, all of these projects come in direct relation to this uh, beautiful poetic image that uh, Gabaldon did for it in this movie, Macario. Wonderful. Well, now I'm curious because we were talking about colors and everyone having its own um, uh, spectrum of colors and heartbeats. So... What color would you say best describes Raphael's heartbeat? Um, well, let's just go back to our previous answer. It would be black because <laughs> it's everything and nothing. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's what I have. No light in there. Okay. Well, uh, talking about black, at the beginning of um, the COVID pandemic, the normal got very absurd and one could not visit a dying friend or family member. Only remote with screens, beloved ones were able to communicate and say their last words. They were not holding hands, nor were traditional mourning rituals available for closure. It's known from Mexico's traditional Dia de Muertos, 
or Day of the Death, that Mexicans do talk about death, where this is not usual in other cultures, where people tend to silence their grief and not talk about it. And you, as an artist, created a touching art project named A Crack in the Hourglass, an ongoing, and I think it's still ongoing, memorial for victims who passed away during this pandemic. And you certainly had visitors from different parts of the world and different cultures and countries. Could you describe this installation for our audience and tell us about the outcome of this project? For sure. Um, the project was commissioned by Moac Museum in Mexico during the shutdown. And uh, I got COVID myself very early in March of 2020, and it was quite uh, severe because I have asthma and so on. Um, and just stuck in Canada where I have my studio, we decided to make a, a memorial, an ongoing memorial for all the incredible loss that we were all feeling. It's uh, A Crack in the Hourglass is basically a website. You go to acrackinthehourglass.net, all one word, a crack in the hourglass, and you arrive at a system that allows you to send the photo of a loved one, your friend, your family member, who passed due to COVID. When you send it, it arrives um, where the there is a, a machine, basically it's a robot arm, that drops uh, grains of sand coming from an hourglass slowly, uh, almost like a printer, and it's and it starts drawing um, the likeness of the of the image of your loved one. The important part of this very slow drawing is that it is broadcast live. So when you send your photo, it tells you, hey, your portrait's going to be realized in you know 40 minutes. You can tell other people to join to watch together the building, the slow buildup of this person's image in grains of sand. And then once the portrait is drawn, the system automatically makes a web page to commemorate this life's person together with the image and dedication and information about the person if that was supplied. And, um, and then something quite hard happens which is the whole platform where the uh, where the drawing is made is actually a robotic platform that elevates and inclines and then all the sand is pulled by gravity to go back into the device so so far we have hundreds and hundreds of portraits made with the same small amount of sand almost like a mandala that keeps getting rearranged to create the uniqueness of each one of them now, we did this project for two reasons. The first one is because what you were saying, you know, a lot of people were saying, look, my dad went into the hospital sick and two weeks later he died and we couldn't be with him in his last days. And then we couldn't even attend the funeral because of social distancing. And there's something particularly uncivilized and treacherous about not being able to mourn your losses. Um, I think that rituals like funerals, like wakes, like uh, in Mexico, we have many rituals, all cultures have them, are fundamental to reach a closure and to come to terms with a new reality of this loss. And without that, um, we, you know, we, we lost a fundamental part of our humanity. So the project was not meant to replace those rituals. It was meant to provide some way for people to connect to each other across the internet at a time when we couldn't get out of our houses. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is just the volume. So we have over 7 million people dead due to COVID. The amount of, of loss that we have, I don't think that we've really understood how big this thing was. And of course, we're all sick and tired of talking about COVID, but the loss is real. And many of us are trying to live our normal lives as if this didn't happen. When I tell you 7 million people died, it's very difficult to understand that behind each one of those numbers, there's a personal story. So this project also gives that kind of face, you know, individuals whose lives were lost due to this very often due to um, what I would say, uh, unscientific, ridiculous guidance uh, from some countries uh, such as U United Kingdom, Sweden, Brazil, Russia, and uh, to an extent, United States. Um, and also, you know, that minorities uh, were the ones who were most affected, the people who could not. Um, you know, find themselves in a proper quarantine, the people who had like high density of, of uh, people. There's, there's a number of, 
at least here in North America, there is a number of, of reasons why minorities were hit more with the virus than others. But putting a face to it was an important part of this project. Um, it was presented at the Brooklyn Museum uh, until a month ago. And now we have brought it back to Montreal. We're going to set up the machine again because the designs keep on arriving. And so shortly we'll have the piece up and running again. Wow. It sounds like a really, uh, it's a beautiful uh, project. Hey, Rafael, can you please uh, tell us about this fantastic living lab of yours where all these incredible installations are put into life and the people you co collaborate with? I'm, of course, talking about your studio, Anti-Modular. For sure, yeah. So I, I work with an incredible team of 24 full-time developers. Half of us, I have a chemistry degree myself, uh, half of us are scientists or programmers or engineers, uh, but we all want to be artists. And then the other half are artists or composers or architects, and they all want to be programmers. So we have a healthy mix of disciplines in there. They come from seven countries. The head of R&D is Stefan Schultz, who's a Berlin artist who I hired about 15 years ago, and he is just a genius. Um, and then everybody brings and, and contributes to the project. The way we work is similar to performing arts. When you go to a theater, for example, or a contemporary dance or something like this, you will have the name of the director, but you'll also have the script writer and the composer and the lighting designer. You will have everybody uh, who is um, part of it credited. This doesn't happen in the visual art, and it's ridiculous. If you go to my current show at Pace Gallery in New York, you will have my name, but every single one of my assistants is actually named in there because we need to change our culture to reflect the fact that art now is made in teams. And um, so I try to give a lot of credit to them because the projects would not be possible without them. And then another thing to note is that ultimately, there are sometimes times when I'm not the director. I've collaborated, for example, with Spanish architect Emilio Lopez Galeacho, and I just did the visuals. I like it when there is a clear direction, when this these projects are not the result of consensus and meetings, but rather you follow a passion, you follow a bias, a prejudice, you follow that, and you don't really understand why it's being done, and no one should be negotiating with it. We will only know if something is valuable after it's finished, and we see how people react and how history treats it. Um, but there has to be a director in the project. I used to work in a collective, and that was really fun for us, but it wasn't really good for the art, right? I really think that you need to follow somebody's um, obsessions, and uh, but you need to credit everybody. Another thing to note is that I am ADHD, so because I have attention deficit, my studio is a really fun place. We work with water, we work with wood, we work with 3D printing. We are interested in scientific phenomena, political phenomena. We're interested in emotion, perception. So it's a, it's a good place to visit. It's in Montreal, Canada. Well, that explains a lot. And um, that <laughs> says also that your brain and senses are always on, probably, and uh, <laughs> that you're very busy about thinking, uh, thinking about the next piece of art or installation to be created. And the main current theme, as, as we read about, is for you now atmosphere. Um, sure. Do you already have ideas regarding this theme? And where do you and your team get your inspiration from? Um, the question of the atmosphere has been ongoing, of course, for a really long time, but only since about six or seven years, we've been making works actively to try and make tangible the atmosphere. Um, the, the concern, of course, is climate change, the extinction event that we're undergoing. Every three minutes, a uh, species disappears from the planet. Um, I have three climate activist teenage children who keep me honest <laughs> about uh, the world uh, affairs. And when I tell them, I'm so proud that your generation will, they even stop me and say, no, excuse me, you're part of this too. You need to be involved now. <laughs> um, and they're so right. Um, the atmosphere, basically, we're breathing 422 uh, parts per million of carbon dioxide. The scientists have told us unanimously 99.9% .9 of the scientists have told us that 350 
is the correct number that will avoid a catastrophic planetary event. And yet we are continuing to grow that carbon emission. And for me, how do you how do you visualize a silent killer, right? Like we take the atmosphere for granted. One interesting thing of COVID is that for a little bit of time there, we knew that the atmosphere wanted to kill us, right? We knew that we needed to be protected, that there was this silent, invisible thing that we needed to flatten the curve. And now, but that's the same, but with climate change, right? So we are continuously dropping this carbon dioxide in. So, for example, I made an artwork called Vicious Circular Breathing in 2015. It's basically a hermetically sealed glass chamber, a glass room, where you go in, there's a decompression chamber, and you're invited to breathe the air that everybody before you has breathed in. So it's this really disgusting artwork. I When I made it, I thought no one would go in there, but there's lineups to go into the work. And basically, you sit there and you smell the, you know, the there there's there's no filters, so there's all the kinds of airborne bacteria and viruses, you're sharing them. Um, you have a warning for panic because to get out, you need to go through the decompression chamber. You have a warning for asphyxiation because there's only 10 days of oxygen. The spirit of that project is to ask ourselves, how do we deal with the commons? You know, what is, who owns the air? Who owns the water? Who owns the land? You know, why, why is it that, you know, we're accepting that the commons should be um, damaged in the way that it currently is, uh, mostly by capital forces, capitalist forces, um, and not take a stand against it. And I thought asphyxiation was a good way to um, to create that awareness. So the project is, uh, it was going to be exhibited uh, at my retrospective at SF MoMA in San Francisco, uh, and it was going to open in April of 2020. And of course, it got uh, stopped. Now that project is kind of, I don't know, like, uh, I don't know when we can show it again, but the idea of not taking the atmosphere for granted is like a fundamental part of what we're doing now. So talking about atmosphere, life on our planet is several billion years old, and we embody this deep history in our bones, behaviors, instincts, and genes. In the same way that Femi bubbles spread along the Milky Way, galactic material also spreads in our bodies, like the nitrogen present in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, and so on. And I was reminded of this by an installation of yours called Double, which you created in 2018. And this is a compact tower computer that runs fluid equations, generating a turbulent flow of transcripts that resembles start powder evaporating in the infinite of the universe. In both plates, the right uh, and the left, this turbulence is reorganized, forming readable lines of genetic codes. So what is the story behind Double? So Double is, is basically a representation of the DNA of two creatures. On the one hand, the creature is the influenza bacterium. So it used to be that we used to think that influenza was caused by a bacterium, which is now no longer uh, an accepted uh, idea. But this bacterium was the very, very first living entity that had all of its DNA sequenced. So we knew from the beginning to the end what the DNA of this bacterium was. So when you look at this artwork, what you see is the bacterium's DNA, kind of like a broth that's flowing. And then line by line, it starts writing the genetic code of the bacteria. So A, G, C, T, A, G, C, T, and so on. And then there's a second uh, moment, a second screen, where you have another creature's DNA, and it happens to be my DNA. So I got my DNA sequenced, and... Um, And it writes the code, again, GTCA, whatever it is, slowly. What I really like about this is that these are bio, you know, biodetermined portraits of two creatures. And uh, it's almost impossible to know which one's me and which one is the bacterium. Uh, I like the idea that the instructions, the fundamental instructions of life are um, the same for that creature than for me as a human. And... Um, The project is just about the humble, the, you know, being humble by the fact that uh, there is that continuity, right? And art is really good for mourning. So, for example, mourning a loss, but it's also really good for continuity. 
for being amazed at the mechanisms through which we are alive. And, um, and in the case of this DNA project, let's think of it as a celebration of that information that brings us here. In his book, Religion in Human Evolution, Professor Robert Bella, while talking about dreams uh, being a dimension of reality, he cited a paragraph that I'm going to ask uh, Petra to read of the dream of Scipio, Cicero's concluding expert dialogue on the Republic, written approximately in the year 185 before Christ. And this recount, Scipio talks about having met his father and grandfather in the highest heaven, where they now dwell. When I gazed in every direction from that point, all else appeared wonderfully beautiful. There were stars which we never see from the earth, and they were all larger than we have ever imagined. The starry spheres were much larger than the earth. Indeed, the earth itself seemed to me so small that I was scornful of our empire, which covers only a single point, as it were upon its surface. So as I was reading this, I was stunned because a moment ago, I had just seen NASA's release of the sharpest and deepest photographs ever made of the distant universe, produced by the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. And this description of Scipio dream seemed to perfectly fit the description of, of these photographs. Um, this also reminded me of these beautiful, huge spherical installations of yours that hang in form of a monumental chandelier. One is called Blue Sun and the other one Solar Equation. Both simulate the turbulence flares and spots visible on the surface of the sun and are animated by fractal flames combined with pictures from NASA and from other um, observatories. Well, the CSDO, right? From NASA and the SOHO Observatory. And I want to ask you, besides from depicting the sun's temperature, do these color shades of yellow, orange, and red in solar equation and blue and white in blue sun have a sy symbolic meaning? Oh my God, yes. I'm so glad you're asking this because there's a massive misunderstanding about the color of the sun. Whenever you see an image from NASA, what you're seeing is a colorized image, right? You're seeing densities of intensity Uh, being presented, but then the colorization process is a process by which we make them um, more inside of the Dante's uh, <laughs> inferno kind of imagery. We think of the sun as sharing the same colors as a candlelight or as a fireplace, but that, of course, is not true. There's a massive misunderstanding about the temperature of color. The reds and the yellows are, in fact, the coldest colors, the most inefficient colors, whereas the blues and the violets and the whites are the hottest colors. So what happened is when I first made the project solar equation, uh, volumetric solar equation, which is the chandelier, it was commissioned by the National Museum of Art in Quebec. And I made it and it looked great. Um, but it was orange and yellow because I wanted to give it that kind of traditional understanding of the colors of the sun. And then when the Koreans, uh, who were uh, the Amor Pacific Museum of Korea, uh, who were also a commissioner of the work, said, you know, this is great project, but for us, a big red ball represents Japan. And then I said, do not worry, because the real colors of the sun are blue and white and violet. And then I made them a blue sun and they were very happy symbolically with it. This is to say that color is a specifically cited social and historical and cultural uh, um, projection, right? Um, the fact that in Korea, the reading of the sun as a massive red ball was unacceptable or at least less palatable than the blue sun, which is a more faithful representation of the sun, to me was immensely uh, illuminating because it tells you it tells you that we think of, of the sun as a universal, but it is nothing universal about it. It's still an entity that we're trying to figure out. SDO, um, the Solar Dynamics Observatory and SOHO, are, are two observatories that NASA have put there, you know, as recently as I think the SOHO is 20 years old and the other one's 10 or something. Um, these are the images of our time, the images of 
the explosions, the, 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 the possibility for life on Earth to happen thanks to these explosions, this complexity, this dynamics is fascinating to me. And it also is a symbol of, you know, the problem that we have now with global um, warming, with ozone layers, with all of this stuff, but also the solutions, because photovoltaics is one way in which we can harness the power of the sun to maintain life on Earth without wiping it out as the current um, fossil fuel industry would like us to. With this, its history of division and trauma, as well as the lively and extravagant art scene, Berlin seems like an ideal place for your art installations. <laughs> so we are wondering, when can we expect a beautiful art installation of yours in Berlin? I can't wait. I I was recently in Berlin and I saw uh, the Hamburger Bahnhof and I just it, it is such an incredible place and such a beautiful collection of works that they have on view. Um, there are so many sites in Berlin that I would love to intervene. I, I've only worked in Berlin once, I believe. Um, it was in post Platz. I did a project with an architecture firm called Realities United, and we made my project 33 questions per minute um, part of the media facade that was there. But I, I go to Berlin often, and it's a city that I admire greatly. So my only problem is that, as I said, my head of R&D is from Berlin. And whenever we're in Berlin, he's like, oh, we should move here. And I'm like, no, no, wait. Uh, you know, I have to stay in Montreal a little bit longer. Uh, he, he loves it, and so do I. Um, I would really like an opportunity to do shows there. So the struggle between good and bad and the presence of a higher force is a constant within all cultures. Influenced by Joseph Campbell, professor of literature who worked in comparative mythology and religion, George Lucas became a modern storyteller of old myths through the Star Wars saga, where the constant battle between the forces of light and darkness and the hero's journey of all myths was portrayed. Dehumanization, produced by the takeover of machines, was central and was masterly illustrated in the Death Star battle. Indeed, a battle between life versus technology, where the role of faith was crucial. So in this scene, Luke Skywalker is preparing to blow up the battle station with his X-Wing fighter, and suddenly, his mentor, Obi-Wan Kenobi, a Jedi Knight, talks to him from the great beyond. Lucas hears a voice, Use the Force, Luke. But Luke is not sure if this is for real or is it everything just in his head. Then Obi-Wan Kenobi voice is heard again saying, let go, trust me. Then finally, Luke gets it and turns off his computer. On the ground, everybody, everybody is obviously perplexed and confused and ask him if it's something wrong and why did he turn off his computer. No, he answers, I'm all right. In this moment, Luke is flying only on instinct. He breathes and centers his full attention, and when the right moment comes, he takes it. This one shot. And then a few heartbeats later, the Death Star is destroyed forever. So, Raphael, do you believe in the Force? And is technology inevitable? How do we pull technology out of the darkness into the realm of light? Yeah, it's troubling because I am a very, very, very uh, militant atheist. And so I love to be radically empirical. Um, but I, I can tell you that I do believe in certain things that require faith. For example, I very much believe in uncertainty. I believe very much on on the unknown, right? The, the fact that the majesty of nature shows us every day to be humbled as we approach with a scientific method to to be rewarded with you were talking about the the web telescope images i mean we can't begin to imagine what that is and that's when we look out when we look in and we look into atoms and into quarks and into super strings we are likewise fascinated by what we're seeing because our capacity to understand this it, it is not there yet. So I love I love to be thinking about this force as being nature itself, as being phenomena, as being part a continuous fluid of 
dynamics and entropy and enthalpy that are constantly at play. And, uh, and to offer a certain kind of respect to that is, is a part of why I became a scientist and why I, I love the scientific method. Um, I think that the Luke Skywalker story is a story that comes from a very sort of Western um, colonial perspective where, you know, this person, this white man, is told to just believe in his instincts and to break through the establishment. It's the same story of Columbus, it's the same story of, of uh, Hernán Cortés, you know, it's these people who wanted to reach new levels and new heights. And what that story is forgetting is that, you know, you are you know, witnessing the mass murder of everybody in the Death Star, you know, and I, I and I find it problematic only because of how that relates to our own story, right? Um, today, we're living in a new day, and this new day is the end of the frontiersman, the end of the avant-garde, the end of thinking about ourselves as not listening to reason, but rather being a rugged individual that goes with their intuition and their beliefs. And so I... I believe in the force. I believe in the force of uncertainty, the force of entropy. I believe in the fo expanding universe. I believe in the um, uncertainty principle, indeterminacy, all these things I believe in. Uh, and I believe science is a place of intense um, doubt and intense creativity. And that the more people study science, the more they'll realize that this 19th century idea that science is just positivist and technocratic and techno optimist is not the case. Science is just a set of methods that allows to investigate the world and allows to contravene. If evidence is shown otherwise, we go and correct our models. This is uh, what I'm most in belief on. Okay, so before we end our interview today, I want to ask you and ask my co-host Petra and our head of production, Misha, to listen to an abstract of a song and to think of the first color that comes into your mind and then write it in a piece of paper. So results will be revealed in our episode of Sound of Color <laughs> with Professor Karen Schloss, that, who made a fantastic um, study with Professor Palmer from Berkeley University regarding music, emotions, and colors. Uh, but for now, and to close this interview, I'm going to ask you, Raphael, to please describe this color without saying which color it is. And you cannot use any color names, please. Got it. I think it's the color of flow, it's the color of bubbles, and it's the color of layers. Thank you so much, Rafael Lozano Hemer, for your time and a brilliant interview. Thank you, Petra and Ceci. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you, Ceci. Please be sure to check this episode's description to find information about Rafael Lozano Hemmer's work and his ongoing and coming exhibitions. Thank you, Petra, and thanks to our listeners, wherever you are, for having allowed us to share time with you. We will see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>